what I like to say is that music is a doorway, not an end. It primes the pump. Does. So when music brings us to this doorway of which story can happen. So what I do with caregivers is say, once you, when you listen to a piece of music with someone, it's not the end, it's the beginning to maybe elicit story and memory and to just be in a beautiful connected space that they're not in in the rest of their day. Sylvia and Sylvia, me. Sylvia and Sylvia me. And Sylvia and me. 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 Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and Me, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. Hi, I'm Ileana Kadushin, and I'm an audiobook performer, a voice coach, voice teacher, uh, executive director of Stories Love Music, a nonprofit, and co-host and co-producer of the Know I Know podcast, as well as a performing artist. Truly a, a, a large multi-hyphenate existence. And I'm happy to be here. Welcome to Sylvia and me. Liana, thank you so much. And wow, see, I don't need my notes because um, I don't know if I could add on much more than you added on. I don't know. Um, you, you, you are doing it all because it's not a question you've done it you're continuing on just about every medium that you just spoke about and one of the things that you said you're a performer of audiobooks which is something that as i said a few minutes ago it's different than being a narrator mm -hmm. because you actually perform what i'd like to do is go back a little into how you even got involved in the arts and your creative ability, um, where did that all of a sudden awaken? It was definitely not all of a sudden. I would say even as a little kid, I remember one day my parents said they walked into my room and I was holding a little micro cassette recorder and I was talking into it and listening back to my voice. Now, if that wasn't a, a hint of what was to come, I was pretending to be a newscaster they don't again know where I got it. I was like, hello, welcome to the nightly news. I'm Ileana. And I was doing that kind of recording and listening back, which is very funny for like, I don't know how old I was, six, seven, eight years old. So I think the voice fascinated me early on of what we could do with our voice, um, how it expressed ourselves. So that started pretty early. Um, and then I go through school, high school, exploring theater, exploring music, uh, loving, loving telling stories, loving entertaining people with my voice, um, drawing them to me with the energy of my voice. So by the time I land at NYU um, to go to Tisch School of the Arts and I'm studying uh, all of that world of theater and acting, I was already well on my way as being totally fascinated with um, the voice and story and music. Did you read a lot of books growing up? Oh, yes. I was read too. Uh, once I learned how to read out loud, you couldn't stop me. A voracious reader of books. Definitely always had a stack of books by my bed, and that never has not changed. As a little girl, I had a stack of books by my bed, and as an adult, um, and I like, uh, you know, I like having a lot of variety. So is there any particular voice that you heard, maybe a character or maybe a person that said, gee, that's so, there's something about it. And maybe you started to mimic it or, you know, try your own voice. Interesting. Yes, I would say probably even as early as when watching cartoons, uh, playing around with character voices. And a lot of times, and it was probably, you know, kind of irritating to people in my lives, I was also doing it with people in my life, I would mimic their voices if they had a distinct accent. I was fascinated. I would love listening. I liked engaging people in conversations because I like to talk to people, but I also loved it because I would hear their voice and I'd go, oh, they have a Southern accent. I wonder if I could do that. Oh, and, and so if they said to me, hey, Ileana, nice to meet you, I would... I would mimic it back and I was like, you know, 
I was like, I don't know if they think this is rude, but really <laughs> I'm fascinated and I'm, I'm mirroring it back to them because I'm fascinated because they speak differently than me. So I did that with a lot of people in my life and living in New York, when you're, we're surrounded by so many different people, just walking down the street, if I opened my ears a little more, I could hear voices and then I would very softly to myself do them right away. And if it was an accent or a way of talking, I would mimic it to see if I could just get it in my body and have a recall. And New York, of course, in New York is, is, you know, for people who haven't been there, it's the city to people watch. Usually you, know, you stand and, and you can watch all a variety of people just walking by. And what you do is even one thing more, um, instead of watching people, it's listening to their different voices, which you couldn't ask for a more, you know, uh, diverse uh, setting to hear such a diverse, uh, you know, tone and accent and, and, and so on. Although nowadays with people talking on their phones, you never <laughs> You know, I, I think it's, it's difficult to know whether someone's actually talking or not. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, talk, oh, by the way, one of the series that you, uh, you performed was uh, Stephanie Meyer's Twilight book series. I did indeed. And I know a lot first... of people asked you how you, um, because it's not just female voices that you do. So the character Edward, can you tell us how did you, where did you go to, to get that? Because I know you had a lot of acclaim for um, doing that character. Well, the whole series, and I have to say that was actually the very first audiobook audition I ever did as a little newbie, if you can imagine. Um, had never done audiobooks, was doing voice performing in other aspects and commercials and uh, was the voice of Nickelodeon Jr. and was doing a lot of voiceover performing, but had never done audiobook narration. And I expressed an interest after hearing uh, Jeremy Irons perform The Alchemist. Um, and I was just fascinated that that was a thing. Oh, yes, people read books and record them and people listen. So anyway, cut to my first audition uh, was for Stephanie Meyer's Twilight, which then no movies had been out. So it was just, it was the book. And um, being a part of that series for your very first series was being thrown into the, to the fire, proverbial fire, because they were very long books, 700 plus pages. So for your first series, and as to your point, not only voicing the main character, um, and her whole point of view, Bella, but all the other characters, including the very prominent male characters. And it was something Edward and Jacob, the love triangle. Um, it was something I was slightly nervous about when I first started developing it because I had a very, I have a very um, strong feminine voice. My voice naturally is very feminine. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to do an impersonation. I don't want to impersonate being a man. I want to connect really deeply and, and then hope that, that then my voice will follow my deep connection to the character and what he means to the lead character, Bella. So I just decided I'm going to, I, this is done in Bella's point of view. So I'm going to embody Edward as I think Bella would want him to be as she sees him, as she's experiencing him. And that turned out to be a good decision on my part because it made it more organic for me. So it was something that I could perform without feeling too awkward. But then the feedback that I got to your point, I got many lovely letters over the years from people in every country because this book was translated into hundreds of languages and just stratospheric phenomenon that just blew me away. And the letters that would say, the way you voiced Edward, I felt more connected to it than when I saw Edward Pattinson in the movie, which always cracked me up. I was like, you know, laughing and I thought, oh, okay, good, they got it. The, the letters would speak to the fact that the voicing of Edward revealed how Bella felt about him 
and why at her point in life feeling so awkward and feeling so alone after her parents uh, divorce and longing for something so deeply that that's what he represented. And that's what I did overall in the series was tap into the longing and the awkwardness and the, the fantasy life. And I mean, the experiences I had, whether it was fans from sending me gifts, uh, soldiers in Afghanistan sending me care packages, telling me that, you know, they would listen to those audiobooks at night just to relax. Um, it really changed my life because it was the beginning of audiobook performing to me and to be involved in such a huge project from the very beginning was um, really ch life altering. Well, one of the um, books that you performed, which really got my attention, was Nadia Murad's The Lost Girl. She's 2018 Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate. And I had, did have the opportunity of uh, having a conversation with her director of programs, uh, Olivia Wells. Tell me how, how, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with that and how that, um, the, how that touched you? I get chills just as you introduced her. I got chills. I got those goosebumps remembering um, when they reached out to me. Um, uh, I think, honestly, I think what was really beautiful about getting this opportunity was that my activist work that I do um, outside of being a performer, it's very, I put it out there. So I want people to know that not only am I a performer and an actor and a singer, but that I'm an educator and an activist. And I put that word out there so that people really know that those are the things that are important to me, the protection of women and girls and um, elderly and seniors and the environment. I put out, I lay my cards on the table about what I care about. And I think because I did, I was reached uh, out to by the producer um, and, uh, and the publishing company of that. And they said, we have this book uh, Nadia Murad's memoir, The Last Girl, and we want to do the English language audio version for Amer tell her story to American audiences. And we think that you would um, be the right person for that with your work that you do, um, who you are as a storyteller, and also the work you do um, as an advocate. And I was thrilled, and it felt like a great responsibility to just tell her story with respect. Um, to share with the audience the emotional um, experience that Nadia went through um, of being kidnapped and at such a young and tender age of a girl being, um, you know, uh, kidnapped and um, taken, you know, taken away, ripped away from her family after the Yazidi village had been ravaged, so much violence and all the women and children taken and forced into these marriages and that she had the strength uh, to overcome and not only escape um, the kidnapping um, that she experienced, but then become a goodwill ambassador, mm -hmm. uh, use, be, end up creating this journey out of this, that she won the Nobel Peace Prize to your um, point and working with Amal Clooney, the human, her human rights lawyer, and just in her mind, wanting to make sure that she was the last girl. That was her mission. I want to be the last girl this happens to. And that's a huge um, statement to make. But as someone that also runs a nonprofit, I know that any organization, you need to have a big, powerful mission, even if it seems scary. And she did that. And Telling that story was poetic and beautiful. And there were many times when the director and I just, I stopped because I was just overwhelmed with emotion and tears. And there were just a lot of moments where I just couldn't imagine being in her shoes. And I just hoped I was doing it justice in, um, in really connecting to the emotional experience that she went through. Well, that says a lot for who you are and what you're able to do. And you mentioned the word um, activism, or yeah, actually you said activist, I'm talking activism. And I want to get into that. Uh, first, I want to talk about, you wrote and performed a one woman multimedia, 
multimedia musical called Devour the Apple. And can you tell us, because it was about different generations of your family and the relationships with each other and the women in the family. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? Oh, I'm, I'm so pleased that you asked me about that piece because that was my very first self-scripted um, piece after getting, after graduating from NYU. Um, yes, I wanted to talk about how different generations of women in one family could be experiencing life so differently just from one generation to the next. There's my generation, my mother's generation, and my grandmother's generation, my great great grandmothers. And to have an acknowledgement as a woman that, and this helps you not take something, your life for granted, but that your mother's generation is different than your own, your grandmother's. And so I wanted to explore that in terms of self-acceptance, of, of looking at myself and saying, wow, I've had such a different experience than my mother and my grandmother, and it's part of why I am who I am today. So I just created characters that were inspired by that and that talked about who I was as a woman, as an artist, um, as a uh, women and sexuality, women and their intellect, women and their power. Um, I had, it was multimedia, so I had television screens hanging over the stage for the audience. This was back when like multimedia was really just starting in theater. So I pre-recorded some characters, you know, very inspired by performance art as well as theater. And so it was, I pre-recorded some characters that would come up and then there were characters live in front of the audience. And it was just to kind of change up um, how I delivered um, these ideas. But I would say that it was a very cathartic experience for me as an audience. It was very risky. I felt very vulnerable doing a show about myself as opposed to inhabiting somebody else's story. Now, one of the other things that we mentioned that you do is you're a voice coach. Um, and it, you know, when people think of a voice coach, it's coach, you know, teaching you how to sing, how to talk, how, but your reason for voice coaching is a little bit different. Can you explain what you do as far as voice, voice coaching? So, well, it really, I would say that it depends on who I'm working with, but basically I've created this system for myself with voice coaching and it's not singing to your point and it's not sort of strict speech coaching. It's really what I call voice performance coaching. So whether I'm working with somebody who's in the financial world, who has to do um, presentations in front of 400 people or a board meeting, or whether I'm working with an actor who wants to enhance their voice's connection to their performance, or um, someone that's pitching an idea has to talk about themselves. Public speaking in general, I'm, I'm very um, passionate about the idea that today, no matter who you are and what your profession is, being able to articulate articulate yourself and be a clear communicator as I stumble um, is so important. And there's a reason public speaking is such a great fear that some people would rather die than speak in public. Um, mm -hmm. It's vulnerable. It's, you know, and listen, technology is not an, a, a substitute. So just because today we can text and email and Zoom call and all these things, still being able to look someone in the eye in person and eloquently and clearly and passionately speak to them about who you are and what you do is something I'm very passionate. I love helping people get connected um, and comfortable with doing that. I've also been um, an adjunct faculty teaching public speaking and voice at NYU, my alma mater, the last four years, which has been a big treat to bring um, my voice coaching, which I've done privately, but bring it back to students at Tisch School of the Arts where I studied has been very fulfilling because the voice is a powerful tool and I just love helping people um, integrate it into who they are and their work. Well, that's the whole thing. Um, you know, to the point is you teach people how to communicate with their voice instead of trying to get rid of this accent or that accent, it's really using who they are and being able to communicate clearly. Um, Absolutely. 
So now I want to get to something that I am very um, passionate about. And when I read what you did, it started back in 2012, I believe. Um, you and your husband, James Harrell. Uh, the uh, Sandy, um, S Sandy Storm. Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, Sandy, yes. See, I need, I need help here. Um, 2012. What did you see? What did you experience? Because you say that moment in time changed both of you as humans and as creative people. Exactly. So we were living in Brooklyn and Hurricane Sandy had just finished pummeling uh, the coast and a lot of senior citizen homes uh, that were in the Rockaways were decimated, meaning power, water. So they relocated a lot of people, but a lot of seniors to temporary shelters. Um, and near us, uh, the YMCA, which is on Prospect Park, uh, near Prospect Park had become a shelter. It's that huge one that had that huge indoor track. And so they were housing you know, tons of seniors in there on cots, sleeping until at some unforeseen date they could go back to their senior facilities. But it was gonna be a long time as we know with FEMA and all the things that were going on with, with how to clean up the damage. So we were asked as many musicians and entertainers and storytellers were to go to shelters. People were being asked all over the place in New York, go to shelters, bring some joy, some levity, some entertainment, connect with people. So we were asked to go in to do a concert. My husband and I who are, um, have been musicians for a long time and are married and work together and write music together for all sorts of things. Um, we're asked to go in and do a, sh a performance. So we go into the, hur to the, to the hurricane temporary shelter. And as soon as I walk in, I'm blown away. I see cots, with seniors lying on them under fluorescent lights that don't turn off. And it's very bleak and very depressing. And I have this immediate wake up call about the amount of senior citizens that we have in this country and how the silver tsunami, so as they say, where we're gonna just the tipping point, we're beyond the tipping point. So it starts with that. Then we're performing our songs and we just finished performing one of our original songs called The Joy of Life, a beautiful song my husband wrote. It's very Beatles, very John Lennon, very universal love and joy. And as we finish, a woman in the audience raises her hand and she's blind, she's in her late seventies. She's already been living in the shelter a few weeks. And she says, can I speak to the group, the audience, to everyone? Your song made me wanna speak. And I said, absolutely, the floor is yours. And she stood up and she said, you know, your song, The Joy of My Life made me realize that even though I'm living in this shelter and we've been through this storm that I can find joy every day and that I am a part of something and I can, I'll be okay. And a light bulb, if I had a light bulb of, above my head, it would be going off. And I thought, what can I bring already? Okay, music, storytelling. People need to be engaged creatively in difficult situations to feel that they are seen and heard, that they matter, that they have value, even though things are tough. So I thought, hmm, I don't know exactly what this is gonna look like yet, but I'm gonna do something as an artist that's gonna meet a need in society. In fact, cut you did. So cut two, I start developing a program, stories, well, I start developing something called Stories Love Music. Uh, where I go out into do field work with my husband and I go into Alzheimer's units and we work with uh, senior citizens with dementia and Alzheimer's and their caregivers around music, around storytelling. Two things I've done professionally my whole life up until that point. And I see miraculous things around me with people and how they transform under the spells of music and story. But then there's another pivot where I say, how can I affect the greatest change? I'm just one person. And I think about the caregivers and that there's 40 million plus caregivers in this country. And if I'm gonna really affect a change, I have to work with them, not the seniors, to really have a lasting effect. So in 2017, I found Stories Love Music as a 501c3 nonprofit. 
And we develop a program called the Joy of Creative Engagement for Caregivers, which teaches caregivers how to use music and storytelling for their own self-care and stress management, but also to deepen and nourish the meaningful relationship of taking care of someone who has memory impairment. And it's just incredible. And, and that's one of the things that people sometimes forget about, and that is taking care of the caregivers. Amen. Because if you don't take care of the caregivers, if they don't take care of themselves, they can't then take care of the people they're caring for. And it's ironic, my mother, who um, she passed away back in 2013, but she taught nursing and uh, her, um, her focus was on seniors. And she co-authored a book on uh, basically it takes more than love being able to take care of yourself, the caregiver, which to me is, uh, I, I love what you've done with stories, love music. Uh, and we all have stories to tell and music just lights up. It could light up, it could bring back memories. We've seen that in Alzheimer patients. We've seen that in, in so many different uh, ways. Uh, that you're doing this and you realized uh, you thought of how to actually do this on a larger level than you and your husband going in to, you know, each place separately. So what was one of the, I don't know if you can top the woman at the shelter. Um, how have the caregivers um, found, found joy in, in being part of this? Well, I can top it, Sylvia, and that's what's kept me going. I love because it. that day, that woman who said that, that we helped her find the joy of life in that day, I've had zillions of those moments every year in developing this program, which has been the gasoline to keep me going because it's not the only thing I do. So taking this on, I had to fill myself up and motivate myself. And the motivation came from these incredible transformations that would happen when someone with memory impairment would be lit up and animated from a song that would allow them to talk to their caregiver and connect with their caregiver in ways that would shock the caregiver. But I've had incredible, I could tell you a really fun story. I was working with a man um, who was in his 80s, late stage Alzheimer's and his home health aid. And we were doing a session together so that I could help her continue to do it when I wasn't there and work with him. She worked with him in his home. And when he was, before he got Alzheimer's, he would, he's Jewish and he would love to go to synagogue and sing in Hebrew. And so we would often, I would encourage the caregivers to lead him in these Hebrew songs. And there was a song he loved about peace, Shalom Alechem. Oh, and as he, song. Yes, and he loved it. And even though he wouldn't talk normally through the rest of the day, when we would sing in Hebrew, those would, he would sing every word in Hebrew with great enthusiasm. So I would always say to him, you know, you can stop any time during the song and we can talk if you ever want to say something to me. So we're singing, I'm leading him in the home and he's waving his hand. I said, oh, you want to say something? So all of a sudden, seemingly out of nowhere in the middle of singing this song about peace, he says, yes. He looks me right in the eye and he says, yes, I was just wondering what it's been like for you in this life being a woman. <laughs> and his caregiver's jaw was on the ground because this is a man that would grunt or just say yes or no, or, you know, and I said, oh, so I launch into this whole thing about what it's like to be a woman and how I've had to find myself. And I go into this whole feminist thing. And, and then I say, does that make sense to you? And he goes, I don't know, I'm a man. <laughs> and now would you expect someone, the caregiver, myself, we would not expect to have an exchange with someone like this who has Alzheimer's. And it was a great lesson that the person is there that's and it. that the whole life that they lived up until that diagnosis is there. The, the, as you mentioned, the path and the research of people like Oliver Sacks and many neuroscientists and music therapists have, have already studied the impact of music on the brain. And what I like to say is that music is a doorway, not an end. It primes the pump. Does. So when music brings us to this doorway of which story can happen, 
So what I do with caregivers is say, once you, when you listen to a piece of music with someone, it's not the end, it's the beginning to maybe elicit story and memory and to just be in a beautiful connected space that they're not in in the rest of their day. That is an absolutely beautiful, magnificent story because music does do that. You know, if you watch any of the old movies or you look at any of the, um, you know, the research, music brings out so much in so many people. Um, and it doesn't matter what they love. There's something, especially a memory, especially a song like, like that, Shalom Aleichem. I mean, it's a beautiful and it brought back his, it, it went into his brain and brought back memories, beautiful memories that he was able to not only sing along, but then all of a sudden ask you that question. To be curious about my experience as being a woman. That was somewhere in there. <laughs> I, it's absolutely fantastic. I'm almost speechless. What has your experience been being a woman and doing all of this? <laughs> fantastic. I, you you know what? I was raised to be a strong woman, an outspoken woman, a passionate woman. That was definitely part of how I was raised in my family. Um, and I think it has been a big part of, of who I am um, mixed with the fact that I'm a very, uh, you know, connected and engaged person and, and curious person. And, and I love to talk to people. And um, it's part of why I created um, my podcast. Uh, That's, with that my was my next because, thing. Because I think it's really the tr one of the truest expressions of who I am and the vehicle that it allows me. Um, it was in 2016. Um, and, and podcasting is so wonderful because it's really this democratized radio um, where people can talk about what they want to talk about and bring to the table what they'd like to bring about in ways that other forms of media, you just don't have the freedom to do. And in that sense, it's really empowering. Um, but I turned around to my husband and I said, you know, I would like a vehicle that would hold everything that we are, which is I love talking to people. I'm very curious. I love to learn. I love to tell stories. I love to sing. So we really created um, a podcast where we could do that. And I co-host it um, with my husband. It's called Know I Know, uh, where we shed light on what we think we know, which is this idea that we all think we know everything already. <laughs> I know, I know, no, I know, no, 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 I know. But we really don't. Like if I spent you know, hours talking to you and interviewing you, I would find out about things that I thought I knew about, but now I have more depth. And it's allowed me to shed light on people that I think are the rock stars in our society. As someone that runs a nonprofit, like I was just talking about Stories Love Music, I love featuring people that have nonprofits um, on my show, because these are really, I think, our unsung hero rock stars in our country is people that run nonprofits, they roll up their sleeves, they right. see problems in the world, they attend to problems without a lot of glory, just a lot of grit and hard work and compassion and empathy. And so I love featuring um, people like that on my show and they just inspire me. And then we also do music inspired by our guests and I tell stories. It's just, it's a beautiful vehicle. I really, really enjoy it. I know the feeling and your, your goal, uh, connect and engage, which you've done right now, uh, beautifully. Um, what is your, your next, so your, uh, your performer, your, uh, performer in audio books, your performer, you know, you write and sing, uh, and perform music. You have a nonprofit, you have a podcast. You do some writing. Um, what's next on the agenda? Maybe taking a nap. Oh, cool. <laughs> Especially on a day like, what is the day? I'll Getting some that. sleep. <laughs> um, yes, there's a lot, lot on the table. I mean, with all of those projects we've talked about, they're always kind of a work in progress. So, right, the Stories Love Music, we actually launched our first uh, online version of our program that we would normally do in person. So I'm in the middle of teaching that online to caregivers. Um, 
interviewing people on our podcast for our um, race and community esteem series and our going green environmental series. Um, so I'm booking and interviewing people um, for that. And then music wise, you know, my husband and I have done music for um, film and television soundtracks and commercials. And so we're always working on uh, media projects where we'll, um, we have a, a recording studio of our own and we record um, voiceover and sound and music for all sorts of media projects. So we always have um, those kind of fun creative projects and working with my husband is, is a, a treat that has um, really just been such a beautiful thing in my life to be married uh, to someone who's my creative partner. So it means that in the home, there's always things percolating uh, and happening, you know, we have to sometimes just take out time and be husband and wife, but uh, <laughs> there's always, it's always a creative laboratory over here. Well, Liana, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, there isn't one thing that you do that I don't think is sensational. My favorite is stories, love music, and what you've done for um, seniors and for their caregivers, which is huge. So I thank you for being with me here today. And I look forward to listening to your podcast and hearing your music. Oh, well, thank you so much for asking me to be here. I love um, what you're doing and you're shedding light right on people and their stories. And it's it's a beautiful way to engage with the community. And I welcome anyone reaching out to me to, to ask me about anything that they've heard. Um, all my sites, you know, are there. There's storieslovemusic.com, ilianacadushin.com, and knowiknowpodcast.com. So all my projects have sites, and I love hearing from people. Well, thank you very much. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms, and of course, our website, sylviaandme.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned.